Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Jing Su and De David Epstein to discuss Kingdom of Characters, The Language Revolution That Made China Modern, published by our friends at Riverhead Books. Jing Su is the John M. Schiff Professor of East Asian Languages and the Comparative Liter Literature Chair of the Council on East Asian Studies at Yale, specializing in modern Chinese literature and culture from the 19th century to the present. She received her doctorate in Chinese studies from Harvard. Su was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2016 and has held fellowships at Harvard, Stanford, and Pr Princeton Institutes. To moderate tonight's conversation, we are also joined by David Epstein, who is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World, and of the New York Times bestseller, The Sports Gene, both of which have been translated in more than 20 languages. He has a master's degree in environmental science and journalism, and has worked as an investigative reporter for ProPublica and a senior writer for Sports Illustrated. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And please order your copy of Kingdom of Characters from Books and Books below by pressing the green button. It is so important to support our local indies and we appreciate each and every order from the gener generous donations, each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hi, thank you, Saviana. Jing, welcome and, and congratulations on launch day. Thank you, David. Pleasure to be here, to be with you. Um, and I just want to reiterate for people listening, you can enter your questions in the ask a question uh, box at, at any time and we'll get to them later. So if you have something on the top of your head, feel free uh, to put it in there. And so I just want to start by sharing something that made an impression on me from the book, which is this is a book obviously about the modernization of, of language. But to me, who has no expertise in the Chinese language, it was really a book about innovation and, and, and politics and entrepreneurship. And so it, it struck me as this uh, sort of a tale of, of invention and overcoming challenges where tradition bumps into breakneck modernization over and over and over. And I, and I really loved it for that and think that there are, that you, you needn't be someone who is steeped in Chinese uh, to get something from it. So I, want, I sort of want to start talking about with a story. There's so many beautiful stories in the book. And let's see if I can bring that up. So that this isn't perfectly sized, so it's cut off from the screen a little bit, but don't worry about that because I'm not asking anyone in the audience to read this entire story. But this is a story uh, that's in the book and it's, it's sort of a little fable. And to summarize it, it's a story of a man named Sir Shi who has sort of a, a, a thing for lions and he decides he wants to eat uh, 10 lions. And so he looks around the market for lions and one day, 10 lions show up. And so he, he gets them and brings them home and orders his servant to, uh, he lives in a stone house. He orders his servant to clean the stone house and get the lions ready for the meal. And he sits down to his meal only to realize that the lions are actually stone, not flesh and blood lions. And mm -hmm. sort of, you know, bummer for Sir Xi is, is the moral of the story. And this story in Kingdom of Characters isn't presented in order to give some kind of like, you know, cryptic wisdom like that people in, in stone houses should throw stones instead of eating stone lions. Rather, it's used as a demonstration. This is, this is the transliteration into the alphabet that we're familiar with of the Sir Xi story. Again, I didn't size it perfectly for this window, but this is the transliteration. It's just she, 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 over and over and over. So this kind of beautiful script that tells this, this story or this fable transliterated to this. And this is a demonstration of some of the difficulties of taking the Chinese language, which doesn't have the phonetic information encoded and, and trying to transliterate it into the Latin alphabet. And Jing, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, what the challenges that that kind of fable or, or exercise in the book demonstrated. Thank you, David. I think that's actually a wonderful place to start because in many ways, it's almost like to put the Chinese language, right, which has 80,000 characters, and you need at least three to 4,000 to be literate, to put all that into an alphabetic mode to represent itself with 26 letters. It's like putting an elephant in very small shoes. 
So, you know, this particular example, I really like, by the way, because S-H-I also happens to be what my own last name should be spelled as if it were correct. But, you know, my own name sort of represents a sort of debacle and sort of the Romanization process where it took a long time to standardize, you know, the S-H-I. And as you point out, the problem is China, the Chinese language had a lot to lose. It actually had to suffer a pretty big trade-off, except a pretty big trade-off in order to be alphabetized because they lose the tones. And the reason that tones are so important in Chinese is because there are a lot of characters that share the exact same pronunciation. So if you say my name, Jing, there could be a zillion other Jings and they all mean different things. Whereas mine very specifically means quiet or peace. So this kind of problem is something that the Chinese struggled with essentially throughout the 20th century. How do we take advantage of the alphabetic structure which dominated all the important forms of global communications technology from telegraphs, which was like the internet of the 19th century, to typewriting, right, where you have to court a keyboard, and to computers. So, so this, to go back to the story for a second, and sorry I didn't size the window perfectly, um, but since yeah. what's lost when this is transliterated into the Latin alphabet, the alphabet that we use, is the tonal information. Can you, can you read, if I, you can't see it, so maybe you've got a little remnant, you know, a bit memorized. To me, if I read the transliteration, I would just say she, 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 however many times. Can you read like a sentence or two so we can understand the, the tonal information there and, and kind of hear it and get a sense of it? Sure. So I'll just read the first sentence. So I, I hope that everyone could hear that there's a kind of tonal modulation because each of those character actually are sounded at different pitch, which is really what a tone is. The way that we think of, and actually we have tones too in English speaking. So let's say when you say yes versus yes, right? For us, that's kind of difference between interrogatory and a kind of em emphatic response. But in Chinese, all this is kind of um, codified because actually there are more than 300 dialects, spoken dialects in China, and they actually have, have slight different tonal variations. So in some ways, you know, Jing might not sound like Jing if it's spoken by another dialect speaker. So the big project for China before they could alphabetize and westernize was actually the first thing to do was to standardize what a spoken Chinese is supposed to sound like. Mm. And what would, by the way, how would you translate that sentence that you read? Like if you were going to just say what the meaning was in English? Uh, can I see it again? You bring it up again? Let me make sure I have it. So um, there's a Sir Shi who is in the stone chamber, a poet of a stone chamber. Um, he likes eating lions and he vowed to eat 10 lions. Okay. This is not a fable for, the, for vegetarians out there, obviously. Well, it ends up being stone lions, so. It's That's okay. true. Vegetarians in the end. <laughs> um, and so this is just one, there, there are a lot of, I think, brilliant demonstrations in the book of the technical challenges. Uh, you know, sometimes they feel overwhelming, I have to say, reading the book, thinking about, because you know, obviously the, the QWERTY keyboard, for example, is standardized for computers before Chinese is, is on computers, essentially. And so China has to kind of adapt to that. And I found myself asking at various points in the book, given these technical challenges, you know, why? why? Why are some of these people trying so hard to, to do this, to, to make a Romanized version of the Chinese language? Can you talk a little bit about why some of the people over sort of the, the more or less century that you document in the book worked so hard to, to make Romanized versions of Chinese and, and to, to make it work for the telegraph? Yeah. So, you know, when I think about this book and what, and I ask myself, God, what would have happened to China if it didn't modernize its language? I think actually two big things would happen. One is that the enormous population, you know, 1.4 billion people now might not have been literate as quickly and as, 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 as well as they could have in the 20th century, right? So there would have been a large illiterate population. And second of all, they would miss something a critical threshold that's even more important for our time, which is actually digital literacy, right? If you think about it, you cannot input Chinese into computers. If Chinese language cannot be a kind of data that you can you know, use as a way of sending texts, sending files, or doing natural language translation, like you can't put in a Google Translate to something in Chinese and want to know what it is in Russian or English or French, 
then China would have missed out on two very critical thresholds, right? Nationalism, which has its own language, its own territory, we know from theories of 19th century, um, and also essentially everything that makes our world modern, it would have also missed out on. So oddly enough, this great vision, this understanding, this realization was, um, was arrived by these average people like, like you or me, um, you know, what I call the second and third stringers of history. You know, so these are not the big martyrs and they're not the big revolutionaries, the leaders that we know. Um, they're the ones who picked up the pieces after every war, every revolution, of which there were many in 20th century, and try to figure out how do we move China forward? Because we don't want to lose our language amidst this tide of Westernization, right? We don't want to completely alphabetize, but we have to figure out how to make the Chinese language work in telegraphs, in typewriter, in computers. So for instance, for telegraphy, the challenge is quite significant because telegraph, you do Morse code, there's dots and dashes, but they're only meant for 26 letters of the alphabet, right? And then they have also combinations for numbers zero to nine. But how are you supposed to send characters? But you know, telegraphy was around 1870s, but that was also only three decades after China came out of the traumatic experience of opium war. It was very skeptical of Western technology because it was sure that that was just a pretext that Westerners used. And it kind of had a good reason to be suspicious because after China has said no to foreign powers, in fact, their response was, I see your telegraphy, but no thank you. You know, we have good men on horseback who can do the job just fine. So they were very wary of letting Westerners in with their cables and businesses and profit-making um, approaches. But the Danes, for instance, um, who actually were the, uh, were a, um, they basically had a monopoly over telegraphy in the 19th century. They decided not to take no for an answer. So on a moonless night, and I write, this in, write about this in chapter three, they basically snuck onto the Chinese territory, brought the cables with them, laid them down secretly, and left before dawn. And just like that, they just decided they would do it anyway. So, you know, China's experience of Western technology was not an entirely positive one. And it always felt that it was disadvantaged because of its own language, that it should have built its own telegraphic cables. It should have codified characters for telegraphy, but it missed out on that window. So the next one, typewriting, it vowed not to do, uh, not to do repeat history. So then you have these young, and again, you have these individuals. What I really liked about this Chinese script revolution, which was the longest revolution, the least known in 20th century, right? It lasted through the entire century. Um, it's been 400 years in the making, spanning three continents. What I love about this revolution was really involved everyone. It was not just the emperor or reformer or the communist state. It was really the you know people who were native speakers and they had a stake in preserving the Chinese language. So my favorite one um, is actually a, a librarian that shows up in chapter four. Mine too, my yes. favorite character in the book. Yes, 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 yes. Mine too, actually, mine too. I was very inspired, you know, it, I should say it was a real pleasure to inhabit the minds of these very little known historic, they weren't historic figures, they were normal people. and. He, Du Dingyou, liked to call himself Bismarck Du because he was determined that he was going to rule the field of library science with an iron fist. And, you know, he was a... So aggressive um, for what we think of as librarian, you know, it's very... You think so, because very tenacious and very persistent, and you all know why. Um, when you look at chapter four, because there was a moment in the 1930s, in fact, it was 1938, when the Japan was about to invade where he was, Guangzhou down south. And Du Dion was, at the time was his university librarian. So Bismarck was just sitting in his office and he was ordered to evacuate. Now, the first thing that crossed his mind was, I have to go home and get my wife and children. But his first thought was, well, I can't very well leave all my books. What about these 300,000 books that are under my stewardship? And so he actually ordered his subordinates to stay behind and help him pack these 300,000 books into these crates that they put together by, you know, cobbling together, you know, blackboards and chairs, taking them apart and put them together. And the rest, he said, protect them and seal them in the basement with concrete. And so that's when his subordinates would, you know, they did a double take and was asking, well, 
you know that the, the, the city is going to be under siege and soon there'll be refugees running for safety. And should we not leave basements for them? And his response, which they found absolutely abhorrent was, well, you know, humans are always clever enough to find a way out, but books don't have legs now, do they? They can not very well run away on their own. And so he ordered them back to work and he even like took down names of people who were not cooperating because he figured after the war, there's going to be a reckoning. And so then he took these, you know, crates of books across five provinces, you know, through a boat ride, because the way he thought about it was, you know, Japan, the Japanese are going to breach our city. They may kill our women and children, and they may even burn down our buildings. But on my watch, they will never destroy the Chinese written heritage. So I thought that was actually pretty extraordinary, right? That these sort of, um, and he later, in fact, he later came up with a car catalog based on not Dewey Decimal System like the way we we have, or you know, no numbers, no alphabet, alpha, no alphabet, but with Chinese characters that he figured out how to take apart as though they were modular, you know, kind of like um, kind of like Lego blocks. Mm. And he would just have them put together, taken apart as though they were like ABCs, right? So break down to components, which you can then put back together, reassemble and move to other places. So he did, in fact, become the father of library science, which was, you know, it's, it's a significant distinction, but maybe not the kind of heroes that we were expecting in times of war. This is you touched on a, a few things I want to touch on, but I but I want to hammer home since you got there one that this, to me, the, the, the characters are so much of what's shown through this book. I mean, it's like a, it's like a, we were talking about the, you know, the, the Winter Olympics next month where you'll be. Um, and I covered the Beijing 2008 Olympics, the Summer Olympics. Uh, but my favorite sport, what I'll be watching next month is short track speed skating, where if people have seen it, it's like total chaos, like skaters going around really short track, they're bumping each other in the relays. People actually come up behind each other and they push the next person who has to go. And then the, the person who launched one person, they they start slowly skating and they keep going around the rink, like watching for a chance when they have to come back in. And I feel like that was sort of the structure of this book. It's like one innovator zooming around, taking on some really big challenge, often competing with someone who's, who's you know, on a similar track, whether that's someone foreign or domestic. And then they launch the next innovator, but they kind of could stay in the fray a little bit. Like some of these innovations sort of come back and back around. And it was sort of a beautiful history of these characters who were innovating. And Bismarck too, the librarian was my favorite. And I don't wanna be redundant here, but just to give people a little bit of the, the flavor of the writing, I wanna read like one paragraph from the story that you just described. So the facts will be redundant, but it's really beautifully written, so, so humor me. So this is when Du is saying, um, you know, go seal books in the basement with concrete. And someone objected. The city would soon be flooded with refugees seeking bomb shelters. Should not the extra space be saved for them? He disagreed. Surely, others pleaded, people's lives mattered more at this perilous hour. Not so, he grunted back. Human beings will always be clever enough to find other solutions, but not books. They were vulnerable and helpless. Books did not have legs and could not very well move themselves, could they? Hushing the dissenters do put people back to work, noting down the names of the faithless who were walking out the door. He expected a full reckoning of words and deeds after the war. And it was sort of so, so ominous, right? While the in invasion is happening around them. And I just thought it was, was one of the many kind of beautiful character studies. And since you mentioned the, the Dutch sort of coming and laying the kind of cloak and dagger, putting down cable, right? In the, in the dark of night, I want to take you back to a character who opens the book where there's, again, sneaky, secretive stuff going on. And this is the character that I think of as, as the fake monk who, who opens the book. And you think he's a monk when the book opens, but can you tell us a little bit about this, this character that opens the book? Yes. So the monk was actually a wanted fugitive. Wang, Wang Zhao, he had been actually um, one of the reformers of the last dynasty. And he was associated with the revolutionaries who, who sought to topple the empire. So he was wanted for that. And he had already made his escape he was perfectly safe in Japan. He had been there for two years. He could have very well lived out his days there, but he didn't want to. He had this burning desire to come back. Why? Because he thinks that he had developed something he called the Mandarin phonetic alphabet, 
that was going to standardize and help phoneticize Chinese in a way as convenient as Western alphabet, but not yet using any Western alphabetic letters, but more drawn from Japanese and kind of a Manchu phonology. So Manchu is actually the, the, the language, the, the ethnicity of the last rulers of the dynasty. So, you know, but Wang Zhao is one of these characters. And I love that image, by the way, of the, of the skating. I think I'm going to steal that when I try to explain my book at the Olympics. Steal it. Make it um, more eloquent, but steal it. Because when you talk about people who spin around, like those who push it forward, that's what we see. We see innovations in a direct line, right, and direct progress. But there are these people who have their moment and they made their contribution and they kind of disappeared. So Wang Zhao, for instance, his great contribution, he came back with that phonetic alphabet. And what he did was he was the one who put Mandarin, which is a northern based dialect, Mandarin forward as the basis for the national language. So at the time, as I mentioned earlier, it's like 300 different dialects. You have to decide, okay, what's spoken Chinese going to sound like? Like before we can project outside and talk about typewriters and telegraphy, we have to figure out, like we have to be able to communicate amongst ourselves. So Wang Zhao's big innovation was that, that was his contribution. But he, he offended a lot of people. Um, and he was thrown in jail when he came back, of course. But he knew the cost and he was willing to bear it. And he was not a very likable person either. So you know, kind of like Du Dingyo, I mean, like, like Bismarck, these people just had such extraordinary um, perseverance and dedication. You know, they were like people who decided they were going to go against the big tide of history and they were going to devote themselves to something that they thought was bigger, right, bigger than their lifespan. And so Wang Zhao, one of the moments I really like about him is, you know, he also wrote poetry, being like a classical scholar. And at the end of his life, he reflected back on, you know, what he had done. He said, you know, in my life, if I had to regret one thing, is that I never listened to other people. And that I will carry with me. Hmm. And he just kind of lived out his days. So I always liked the, in some ways, the cadence. I think the moment when you like, imagine when you push the, the other skater forward, there's this cadence where, you know, history has been propelled by you, you know, into the next stage. And the spotlight goes with that. But the innovators, the individuals who come, you know, sacrifice for that, they kind of fade from the limelight. Mm -hmm. So with every chapter, I always found these incredibly human characters, which is why this book is structured that way, that behind every written character that survives today was actually a bunch of, you know, a cast of human characters who made sure they could make that happen. I, I, I want to bring up one more of those characters before I ask you about some of sort of the the, the political background of the book. Because one of one of the interesting sub-themes of the book is that so many of these choices about language are are political, right? And and when you talked about China, there's loss in giving up tradition in trying to modernize the language. Well, in Taiwan pushed against that, right? The 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 government that ended up in Taiwan said, we're gonna be the keepers of traditional Chinese while while you do that. So there are these political choices. And as I was thinking about politics while reading the book, because frankly when I read you know, you don't have to read a lot of the news to realize that like the US and, and China are not at like an apex of good relationship right now. Um, I'm often kind of more confused than enlightened by news stories I read because I'm not quite sure how we got here. And it was interesting to learn some of the history and to see that pervasive in the book is actually this knowledge exchange, competition, you know, and in some cases exploitation, but also admiration and knowledge exchange between the United States and I mean, some of the these innovators in the book are going between the United States and China. Some of them decide to live in the United States after their their work is done. And one of them who I love is is pictured here. Let's see if I can put that in front of my my face. So I was wondering if you can. Again, it's not perfectly sized, but but this is a let's see. A, this is this is a New York Times headline, right? That says the I, sorry, it's a little cut off, but the headline is the new China will be a new United States. Yeah. Imagine that headline running in the New York Times uh, today. So I was wondering if you could just sort of, ex again, even though it's a little bit cut off, if you can kind of explain what's in this picture, because I think the the picture is sort of symbolic itself and, and who this character in your, in your book is. Yes. So Wang Jingchun is the man who uttered this sentence. And he had a tremendous task at this point. I think it was 1913 or so, 19 things, 1910s, because he was entrusted to represent um, China um, a few years later 
at the International Telegraphic Union Conference in Paris. And Wang Jingchun was there to do something very important because as I said earlier, you know, Chinese telegraphy, um, they didn't have the first mover advantage. And even, they had even less than that because what the Danes did apart from, in addition to laying down cables, they also basically went ahead and designed a telegraphic code book for Chinese characters. It was actually a French harbor master that they hired to do this. And essentially what he did was assign just a random series of four numbers to every character. And sure enough, it got the tele, you can send telegrams in Chinese. But the problem was, first of all, you know, it was unclear what character went with what code because you can't remember that. You can't memorize as quickly as you can alphabet. So if you're operating, if you're sending a telegram as an operator, there's a lot of room for mistakes because you look up these four letters, you know, or, or sorry, four numbers, um, but they're not, there's no rhyme or reason to why they're the way they are. So it was very kind of, um, it was very time consuming and actually was slow, much slower to send Chinese telegram than the English. The other problem was, as I said earlier, the Morse, the Morse code is built for 26 alphabetic letters, but it also prices it in a differentiated way so that the most frequently used letter costs the least. So for instance, the, the least costly, the cheapest letter you can send in an English telegram is the letter E, which is conveyed by one dot. And then I also mentioned it, you can also code a zero to nine, right, numbers. But turns out every number is more expensive than any letter. So in other words, if you send Chinese characters in four numbers, that means every character will be two, three times more prohibitive, prohibitively expensive than sending English. So Wang Jingchuan was sent to Paris to basically argue this before the European uh, stakeholders. The Europeans had not even really thought that this was a problem. So he had to really stay there. He stayed for weeks. He was very astute. Now, this is a man that like, he's not like the, uh, he's not the, the Buddhist monk who's essentially a fugitive. And he was not a, um, speaking of fugitive, you can hear the, the characteristic New York City. <laughs> um, and he was also not, you know, a quiet librarian. He was more a bureaucrat and official, very diplomatic, brought up through the ranks very early on. And so after weeks of negotiation at Paris, he finally got everyone to understand and accept the fact that Chinese was an exception to international telegraphy. In other words, that Chinese had to be recognized as somehow standing outside of the alphabetic structure. Now, that was a win for him back then. You know, people were ecstatic, like finally, now we can start even out pricing now that the Europeans understand what's so hard for the Chinese to do with telegraph. But then he went on and thought that was not enough because his main question was, okay, I got us this far, but still, why does Chinese have to be an exception in the alphabetic world? Like we're still not in it in our, on our own terms. And so when he says the new China will be a new United States, he was trying to disarm people, right? To accept like, yes, China wants to be like the United States. Whereas these days, when you see that, I think our, our feelings, our response to it would be quite different. It's like, my gosh, the new China will be a new United States as though replacing the US. Mm. That's that's a that's fascinating. I mean, the one of the things you told me, and and if people have questions, we're about to take a few questions. Um, but before we do that, that's like it was just I was constantly thinking as I was reading the book about misunderstandings, right? Th this image comes up several times in your book of the maps of humiliation that are these these sort of maps of China that are circulated among people that will have like cartoons or animals or something like that showing parts of the country that were divided up among various foreign powers. And it seems a symbol of like, ne never this again. You know, we need to be united so that we don't go through this sort of embarrassment again. And and as I thought about that, this, this tension between skepticism of Westerners, because in, in, in in the book, my takeaway was that the West tended to approach the Chinese language from sort of two angles. One was as kind of a code to crack, either for economic reasons or for missionaries, for religious reasons, or as something to be studied because there was a feeling that because it required this memorization, it prevented Chinese people from thinking scientifically, basically, which was why they were kind of backward because their language prevented them from thinking scientifically. And so this sort of like roster of 
of indignities that that kind of pile up. And and you made me think of we discussed a little when I was in Beijing. I remember in in Onion article um, that that a Chinese newspaper picked up on uh, that had this this farcical article about how the United States Congress was going on strike because they wanted a new dome for the Capitol and they were so you know greedy. And it got reported in China as look how greedy these American lawmakers are. And then when someone I guess alerted this Chinese publication that actually the Onion was a farcical publication, instead of saying like, whoops, we got that wrong, they did this long correction that said, basically like, do you know in the United States, they have newspapers whose whole role is to lie in order to get people to like buy their product. And it was such a different approach, right? And that was so unusual that so much of what came through, it, I think it just gave me a, a little bit more insight into the different perspectives because it, kind of that saving face and, and, and history of national humiliation, that's just like not a part of, American intuition the same way. Yeah, we were talking about that. It was very different. I mean, China, there's something about it's it is an older civilization. And by the way, Onion also just recently published, past few days, published an article that riffs on the subject of this book about how oh, really how Chinese discover that alphabet comes from Chinese. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine sent it to me. I'll forward it to you. But I think there was a third element in how the West, the Westerners approach to Chinese language, which was that it was exception that had to be brought under reign. If you think about, you know, the universalism of Western values and technology, right? A universalist alphabet, is it really better for technology? Is it more modern? The universal, universality of Western values, like democracy, of course, it has to be universal, right? So, you know, China, whether it's a language or the politics or the custom, always stood out at this, this outlier that had to be brought within its fold somehow. It will, I, Cause you can't be universal unless you can really get Chinese script, which is the most complicated script, right? On board. So when we get to in recent decades where Chinese began to digitize and enter into the computing age, I mean, when they had to code characters in, in, um, in Unicode, they really had to think about how do we adjust? How do we accommodate this huge number of characters like it has to work. We can't call ourselves Unicode, which is short for universal code, unless the Chinese can also use it. So I think it's been this exception that's always had to be brought under reign. Now that's the Western perspective. The Chinese perspective, why is the humiliation so important? Well, you know, China, unlike the United States, has 14 land borders. And at sea, they have six neighbors. This is a very different kind of worldview and political view than let's say United States where you're blessed with two huge bodies of water. You have a neighbor to the south, a neighbor to the north, and that's about it. And so the worldview is also very kind of, it's, it's more secure and expansive. Whereas China had to constantly, it felt a kind of actually over the centuries, a vulnerability to deal with frontiers and barbarians. Right, like ethnic groups around China, especially towards, like they didn't actually look out towards the West until the 19th century after the yeah. Open War. It was more before that, they was more concerned with inner Asian frontier, right? Um, actually 18th century with the West. So the fact that they were then split up after the Opium War with little port taken there with Hong Kong, little pieces there that was occupied by foreigners is very jarring and goes against everything that they had thought over the centuries was absolutely important and critical to protect the Chinese core. So I think there is a lot of room and that, that I love that Onion article you talk about where, you know, Chinese, you know, it's, it's like, it's like this. If you don't know the language, you wouldn't know the humor of Onion, right? If you're not an English speaker, and you're not living in this milieu, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't get the the the, the satire that makes onion what it yeah. is. But and same with Chinese. If you're not a Chinese speaker, if you don't know its language, you also cannot really appreciate or understand why things like humiliation will be so important to it, why face saving is a concept that is so important to culture, why informality and kind of implicit, there's always some kind of implicit, informal way of conduct in social relations then you wouldn't understand that either. So I think it does give open up a lot of room for precisely what I was trying to do in the book is to tell the story about China came to be the global power that it is today, to tell a story that is both unique to China, the Chinese language, 
and universal because we all speak a language, we know what it is, and we don't understand someone or we ourselves are not understood. And so to really understand the drive behind that. Hmm. Wonderful. I'm going to, I'm going to, Jing, if it's okay with you, I take some, a few audience oh, questions. Yes, please. Okay. okay. So here's a, a first one. Appreciate the questions and feel free to, to put more questions in. Um, this uh, listener says, hi, Jing, you mentioned a few hundred spoken dialects. Can you comment on character or spoken differences between regions and how it relates to the modernization and Latinization of the language? Um, there's a second part of this question. It's also when we think of Mandarin Chinese, which dialect is this? For example, Spanish is the dialect from the Castilian region of Spain. Thank you. Um, so yeah, feel free to take one or both of those parts. Um, yeah. So Mandarin is actually a Northern based dialect. There are other dialects in the Mandarin group. Um, but the one that's based in Beijing became the model for what we today think of as Putonghua, which is, means common speech. And the reason why Mandarin came to dominate, well, you will have to, this, you will have to read chapter one and that fateful right. conference where the Buddhist monk did something quite extraordinary. Um, but even to this day, people in the South will tell you, oh, we came so close to becoming the national standard if it weren't for what happened in 1912. So I'll answer it that way. In terms of dialectal difference, well, it's complicated because in general, languages are more diffuse in the South because that's the sea facing part. So there's a lot more movement, especially it's with Southeast Asia, et cetera. So there's also more tones in those languages. And actually, um, if you want to hear what ancient Chinese sounded like, the South preserved those features much more. Mm. Very interesting. So when you're in Hong Kong, if you hear Cantonese, that's close to what, let's say, classical poetry would sound like. In fact, you will hear the rhymes much better when it's spoken in Cantonese than when it's spoken in Mandarin, right? Which went through this is relatively protected, you know, sort of the seat of government for most of the centuries, the, the seat of rule. And since you mentioned Cantonese, another question came in. Is you mentioned the political aspect of Taiwan's decision to continue using traditional characters. And this is beautifully laid out in the book that as Taiwan sort of seeing itself as the, the protector of, of the classical language. Was there similar motivation in Hong Kong to use traditional characters and speak, speak Cantonese? That is a really great question because I have to say the way we think of Taiwan traditional characters, China simplified characters, is really just a, a, a product of 1949, which is when the communists took over China and the nationalists retreated to Taiwan because it's actually the case that simplification, so the simplified characters were actually first proposed by the nationalists as early as 1909. And in fact, simplified characters that exist today, 80% come from before the 20th century, and 30% of that come from actually just over the millennia where you know street vendors or um, actors, you know, when you have to notate something very quickly in a business transaction, you sell fruits and vegetables and you have to do a quick tally. You know, people naturally just start writing the shorthanded way. So it actually exists and it's not fabricated, but most importantly, it is something that the nationalists had proposed. So in fact, they had basically set the stage but because of the wars and revolution in the early part of the 20th century, they were never able to implement in any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And also because there was some resistance from people too, like they don't want to give up character the way it looked. So it actually in 1949, it took, so 1949 is the first time that China was unified in the 20th century, right? Nation state, the first time that was unified. So it's, you know, in order to implement linguistic changes and language policy, you do need a strong state's hand. Does the, well, I have my own answer, but th this next question is, and forgive a pronunciation that's going to come in this, but does the book address the question of whether the lack of a phonetic character set, like Japanese has for incorporating foreign words, impeded the adoption of technologies, with Chinese having to come up with dian now, I guess, electric brain for, for computer, whereas Japanese just used computer. So the question is, did that, because phonetic character set comes up in, in the book um, repeatedly, so... Yeah, if you can discuss that question of whether it whether it impeded adoption of technologies. Um, it certainly did in the sense that it would have taken much longer, right, for Chinese. And in fact, it did take Ch Chinese much longer to come up with a Chinese typewriter, right, or to romanize 
um, their language, even though attempts have been made throughout the 20th century. Um, and Romanization really started with Westerners. The Westerners were the ones who brought the Jesuit missionaries, brought um, Romanization into China in the 16th century because they were actually using it as cheat sheets. They, they came up with transcriptions themselves. And kind of like the way, I don't know, like when I, when I learned Japanese, actually, I sometimes notated with Chinese characters because I can use that to translate what Japanese would sound like. Mm -hmm. And so the Western missionary did the exact same thing. They used Roman letters to remember like little cues or how do I say this in Chinese? Like, I don't know, like, you know, Ni Hao or when we say Wang Zhao, they have to like, okay, I got to remember how to say this. And then that then was shown to the Chinese and they had never seen their own language that way. Now, the Chinese did have a native phonetic system, but it was not the alphabet letters. And it worked by putting two characters, you sort of splice the sounds together. And um, the reason that didn't work is also because spoken language, the sounds drift over time. Like if you ever watch old Hollywood movies, which my mother loved, so I, I saw a lot of that growing up. You know, the way people spoke in those old movies in the 40s and 50s sound really weird to us, right? It's like that their the enunciation is just a little off. So, you know, sounds drift over time and that's inevitable. But the Chinese, the, the way the Chinese spelled their own characters before Western alphabet was very imprecise because people actually forgot what the character was supposed to sound like. Whereas, you know, with alphabet letters, A, B, C, D, you learn it yeah. phonetically. Right. So from the get go, you're not thinking of it as, you know, like a semantic unit. You're thinking of it as a kind of a, a tool, a tool to help learn a language and then move on. Yeah. But Chinese language was not like that. There was a lot of prestige and learnedness and value attached to learning character by character. I mean, when I was growing up in Taiwan, um, I actually didn't learn romanization because I was part of this, you know, traditional preservation of Chinese tradition and values. And so I actually learned by, I had to, basically copy characters um, by hand. Like I had to repeat every character 30 or 40 times a night. And I can wow. see I have, a, I have a callus on my finger that's still like from, you know, gripping the pencil <laughs> finger with a kick. I still have it. <laughs> my worst scar. <laughs> the, um, you know, that question about phoneticization reminded me, I mean, that's a big topic in the book, right? Pinion, this phonetic system that allows people to learn, learn phonetically to speed learning, right? And, and that gets to, my, what I remember in the book was that sort of Mao's two big contributions in language were simplification and, and romanization. Um, and, and I was wondering if you can talk just a little bit about the, if, if, if that's, if I said that correctly and, and what impact that had the opinion, the, the, um, you know, the phoneticization system, because I know that there's a part in the book where you mention what I think is familiar to a lot of people to let a hundred flowers bloom, right? Where it's like spreading language to everyone. We want lots of diversity of opinion and it, it's really spread literacy, but also kind of turned around and then not as much desire for lots of opinions. Yeah. And I think the key to that is to think about the power of standardization. And David, I know you think about this in, in the sports context, but the, the power of standardization is that is equivalent to, in my mind, in this book, the first mover's advantage. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, standards are made to be essentially common sense. It's what happens when exceptions and novelty or quirky usage becomes leveled. You're not, the power of standardization is that we don't even see it. We don't even feel it. But did you know that, you know, um, the sweetness of your toothpaste, I don't know if anybody noticed that your toothpaste is sweet, but that sweetness is regulated. There's actually a standardizing body, the ISO, who actually determines how sweet your toothpaste should be or the curvature of your wine glass. So everything around us, not, I mean, not to mention these days, we're completely standardized animals. I mean, iPhone and how we, how we including, you know, like everything we use, there's, there's literally like standardization is actually an invisible hand that shapes and guides our tastes. And so when you have any language in particular, it's very important for several reasons, unification, Right. If you, if you standardize unification, once you turn that into technology, it is like it's in the groundwater. It's very hard to change, which is exact realization that China had in 1970s when they were thinking about building their own computing environment. Right. Because at the time, China was close to the outside. You know, it was just after, during the Cultural Revolution, the, the country was in no shape. Everything was left in ruins. They lost generation of scholars because nobody was allowed to go to universities. They were all doing class struggle. And so for China, 
they it was a it was it was a time where they think okay that's when you know computers were being developed in America and spreading like wildfire and China had to make a real difficult choice which was ideally we would like our own computing environment chinese programming language chinese keyboards um, chinese parts um you know cpu obviously that's still a problem today of building your own semiconductor and then um but the other choice would be there's already this alphabetic infrastructure out there and it's already globalizing like wouldn't it be easier if we just you know tap into that structure so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and be left further deep behind so you know the story really is about kind of the power standardizing chinese within right as a national language and beginning to push it out as an international standard so when mao came up finally rolled out pinging it was extraordinary because before that you had all these random missionary romanizations Right, because there was not a standard national language in the 19th century. So missionaries Romanized whatever dialect they heard on the ground. And if you ever noticed, by the way, the French Romanize things differently than the Germans, and the Germans Romanize it differently from you know the Dutch. It was a complete mess. So finally, China just like, you know, we sort of had enough of it. We had to take charge. Like we had to Romanize ourselves and tell the world this is how Chinese should sound. So those of you who, you know, go to Chinese restaurants, you ever wonder why Peking Duck is called Peking, but we have the city of Beijing, which is the city that hosts the Olympics. So the reason is because Peking is this residual, it's like what's left over from the days of missionary Romanization. But when you say Beijing, that does not sound like Peking to me. I don't know if it sounds like that to you guys. So, you know, that chapter five is called When Peking Became Beijing. And it's really to mark the shift because once you have standardized romanization, you can actually deliver mail. You can actually figure out where this is supposed to go or whose name is meant. And, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you build census and, you know, basically register people. So it was immensely important. Like I think the, 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 the movement of standardization, and you can see it none better in the way that, why is everybody on Apple phone? Why would we still have a QWERTY board? Even though it's been proven time and time again that QWERTY board feels very unnatural, but because it was designed so that these old striking mechanisms of the typewriter wouldn't stick together if they separate out the letters that, you, that, that are normally typed. So this old reason doesn't exist anymore, but nonetheless, the technology that was built for it stayed. Yeah, the power of, of standardization is definitely a theme that, that comes through in the book. Um, and, and I want to ask you just one more question since, again, since you're, you're, you'll be at the Olympics next month. Um, when I went in 2008, there was this incredible uh, push to, to make it easy to get around Beijing for people like me. Um, you know, translations of everything. And some of it was, was endearing and funny and poetic. I remember a, a lunch dish I had that was marked on my version of the menu as hot fried Wikipedia which is may maybe that's what it really translated to. I don't know. But um, I think this this time around, there's actually maybe going to be some difference in how things like train stations are labeled uh, for people that are going for the Olympic. And, and I'm wondering if you can explain what that is and, and, and what you make of the symbolism. Yes. Well, there's definitely a shift in 2008. You know, every taxi driver, I'm sure you ran into them. Every taxi driver had to learn a few phrases of English, yeah. right? China went out of its way to make sure that foreigners wouldn't get lost in that linguistic milieu. But just recently, um, China actually started changing in Beijing, the subway stations. It used to be called such and such station, right? So at least you say the Chinese name, like Sivanzhan or whatever, and then you still see the word station. But now station has been changed to Zhan, which is the Chinese character for station that is Romanized. So now you have Z-H-A-N. So I find this very curious. I mean, apparently it's a policy they've been trying to roll it out since 2019. But this is the idea of reversing the alphabet. So it's actually now made to sound Chinese rather than English. Mm -hmm. It sort of raises kind of interesting question at the end of this book, which is, does the alphabet, will it remain Western? Does it have to stay Western? Or is it actually now going to be a global tool, right? A global medium where like, like Chinese can appropriate and other people can appropriate it. But it's kind of like become a kind of like a universal uh, resource, as it were. So whether, you know, alphabet has to be Western is kind of the funny question, I feel like, that this phenomenon is raising. But I'll see what I can find out on the ground, David. Great. The, and before we, we end, I just want to say again, that I think... One needn't be know anything about Chinese to to find the book really compelling. And and I was uh, 
alternately, you know, sort of like nostalgic, even though I didn't live through it through, for some of the the exchange that that the U.S. and China had in the book that you that you documented. And our favorite character, the librarian Bismarck Du, he believed in like the ability of sharing language and knowledge to to bring world peace. Uh, and and I found that very inspiring. And at the same time, I worried that like you know sometimes we hear that from from social media entrepreneurs who say like, well, we just have to connect the world and then, and then everything, you know, world peace will flourish. And obviously that has not been the case. And, but I think the book really conveys the fact that these decisions, there are cultural decisions, there are political decisions that go into this um, and, and people can affect them. So like just, just sharing, I think on its own, maybe is, is not enough, but people who were really determined were able to make an impact not only on how language changed, but then the impact that it that it had and and what it did to a culture. And so it was a fascinating lesson. Um, you know, by by turns, I think sort of sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, and I think the the issue is also, you know, this this book is is about the Chinese language, but it's really about the human characters, how the Chinese thought about the language, how they how they solved problems, like what was their rationalization, you know, what was their thought process um, to, to see themselves in this bigger movement and their attachment to their language. I think these are very universal themes. So in some ways, the technical aspect of language is really folded under these larger human experience that, you know, they had the same ambitions, desires, you know, setbacks, successes, failures. And one of the, one of the, one of the purposes of the, why I wrote this book is to really, in some ways, put ourselves in their shoes and because they have put themselves in alphabetic shoes, right? So it's kind of this mutual lens, right? I hope that it will help us see each other more clearly because, mm -hmm. you know, we tend to think of modern China now as 1949 onwards, like communist China. Mm -hmm. And that's been coming into the book until chapter five because the reason is, you know, the China and the West have long been learning from each other and they have been curious about each other much longer than before they turned foes. So that is sort of the final message of the book, I hope. And I would have, I hope it would have been like a wild adventure reading through it because it certainly was for me to write it. Well, you know, the, the one other thing I wanted to mention too is that you come into the book, like you didn't, do, you're a scholar obviously, but as, as you became a journalist for this book also, where, I mean, you were at, you talked a little bit about uh, a meeting where, where the, the fake monk, um, you know, th there's an argument because one word is is pronounced in a certain dialect, and he thinks someone is is cursing at him, basically. So yeah. it's like a yeah. problem. But yeah. you True. Yeah, it's this funny moment because I, David is talking about the very last chapter where um, it actually it, it took me to Hanoi to this meeting of these computer scientists who come together several times, a couple of times a year, to decide which Chinese character gets coded right, into computer. That is to say, which Chinese character gets to live in cyberspace? Pretty big decision if you ask me. But, you know, I'm, a, I'm mostly a scholar, so I haven't been running around the world like David has. But that really took me a while to track them down, to be there, to be an anthropologist. And a similar argument broke out between two representatives, but it was really a Hong Kong representative, a Taiwan representative. And at some point in the time, the representative said, you don't understand because you're not Taiwanese. And I was so struck because at that very moment I was thinking to myself, I just wrote about this in chapter one. Like this is the exact same kind of, you know, difference and passion and a kind of commitment that, you know, drove all my human characters to partake in the Chinese Rip revolution. And I realized that unwittingly, it's only at the very end that I realized that I myself got recruited into this process because, you know, what am I except a modern shadow in some ways of the Buddhist monk, of you know, young engineer typewriter, of the ambassador diplomat at the Paris conference. Um, yeah, all these people who are drawn into the script revolution because they're so curious and they love the language. Did your research took you to Hanoi, to the Vatican Library and, and, and all over the place. And I, I would encourage anyone who's interested, pick it up, check out the first chapter I mean, it's it, it unfolds very cinematically, uh, with with you know a character disguised as a monk smuggling in um, papers that he thinks will change the fate of China, and, and which does in fact change the fate of China. So so flip it open and and give it a spin. It's really a riveting read.
Um, and thank you very much, Jing. Uh, and if, if there's anything else you'd like to make sure people are aware of the book, please feel free. But I think we're about close to the end of our time. Yes, thank you so much, David. Really fun talking to you. As you Pleasure is mine. And here's the beautiful book cover. Thank you both tonight for joining us. And thank you to everyone who came out. And just don't forget that you can purchase your book from Books and Books. Or if you're not from Miami, any of your local indies is still good. And thank you both again so much for this conversation. It was so interesting to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.